and welcome to the Apple Insider Podcast. This is your host, Stephen Robles, and joining me this week is my friend Wes, who's going to be getting his Pro Max as you hear this recording, most likely. How you doing, Wes? Good. Just trying to think about the difference between saying Max versus Max. <laughs> I know. There was confusion already before we started the show. I said, we're going to talk about the Max, and then we're going to talk about the Max. And yes, that is exactly phonetically the same. Was that a homonym? Yes, that's right. Sounds the same. Two different things. Apple had a little event earlier this week. It was notably actually just about the one thing, the M1 chip and the Macs they're launching. We did not see any Apple TV, AirPod Studio, AirTags, nothing. It was all about the Macs only. Were you surprised by that at all? A little bit. I was expecting at least an accessory of some kind, just something. But yeah. Mac only event, 45 minutes right off on the dot. It's kind of wild. It was. And I mean, it was very short. I mean, when they were ending, kind of know when it's coming to the end because you see Tim Cook back up there and he starts talking about how amazing things are. And it's like, is there going to be anything? Nope, nothing new, nothing else, you know. That was interesting. I'm curious if we won't see a random press release though in the next week or two. I feel like those AirPod Studio... Maybe even AirTags could do a press release. You think that's going to happen or maybe not? I don't think so. I mean, those two devices are definitely holiday gifts. Uh, the AirTags being a good stocking stuffer at the studios, starting at probably $400, $500, are a big gift item. If they announced it now or in the next two weeks, we wouldn't see it on sale until mid-December, and you'd be out there trying to buy it on Christmas Eve. It's, it's not really going to happen. And Apple likes hitting their holiday seasons. I'm guessing that, again, it just was a little too little too late and yeah we'll see it in march if if at all because i mean march what is that chinese new year time frame uh when apple can get a little bit of a boost from other things going on in the world but yeah right now it's just not happening all right well let's talk about the event one more thing they announced their new chip and then three max we did the recap episode and so i won't belabor all the details but we did discover some new things since the event if you want to listen to the recap episode it's the previous one right here in the feed it was nine minutes so if you want to hear the 40 something minute presentation down to nine and just get all the announcements you can do that so the first thing they talk about is the m1 chip and so we knew there was going to be some kind of new silicon we didn't know if they were going to call it an a14 something or if it was going to be a different letter and so now we've added the m1 chip to their line of silicon they have the a series the s series in the watches they got the u series in the like ultra wideband stuff so now is the M1. This is their Mac specific chip. It is an eight core CPU for high efficiencies, for performance cores, eight core GPU. Although notably the MacBook Air has a seven core GPU version, which we'll get to in a second. Then it also has a neural engine. Apple touted this chip as being just crazy powerful. They had some interesting charts. I don't know if you saw those, Wes, where you kind of have the performance of the M1 chip and, you know, up to two times faster than, you know, normal PC laptops. But I thought it was interesting the M1 line ends sooner than the PC one. And I'm almost curious if that's a clock speed thing or if it just doesn't have a higher ceiling. I don't know. Did, you, did I read into that or did you gather something from those charts? I didn't pay too much attention to that, but I, I'm I'm guessing just uh, with the same limitations that we're seeing between the two different MacBooks, it's thermal limitations. We're probably hitting peak load and then stopping, whereas Intel chips probably try to catch themselves on fire before they quit. So, <laughs> Right, exactly. Now, some of the Geekbench scores have actually come out, and so I'll put a link in show notes to our article on Apple Insider, but a MacBook Air with an M1 chip, so one of the new MacBook Airs, the M1 chip, supposedly it has a single core score of 1687 and the multi-core score of 7433, so 7,433. Now, if you compare those M1 numbers to the i9 in the MacBook Pro 16-inch, the MacBook Pro 16-inch is 1,095 single core and 6869 multi-core. So it is supposedly the M1 actually benches faster than the i9 that you can get in the 16-inch MacBook Pro. Now, I was wondering if these new Macs were going to tempt me personally, because I actually have that 16-inch MacBook Pro with the i9. And I thought, surely the i9 will be close, if not still be ahead of the M1. But according to these Geekbench scores, the M1 is actually faster than that i9. Now, do you think that actually will equate to real world faster render times and final cut or bounces in logic. Well, I don't know how much we want to get into this, but I mean, this is Geekbench. It's a benchmarking tool that basically runs the processor through its paces as quickly as possible to generate a 
generic test score at the end. And they only just optimized this for the Apple Silicon processor. So there could even be bugs and stuff involved. Mm. These scores, I wouldn't put it too much to real world. And that's not to say that these aren't amazing chips. Like, I don't doubt that uh, pound for pound, these things probably perform better than most Intel computers, including the 16 inch MacBook Pro, but translated to real world. I mean, what are we really seeing here? I've been seeing uh, people on Twitter and YouTube compare these things to iPhone chips. I mean, Jonathan Morrison, or one of those people who uh, do a lot of these things, uh, has been comparing the iPhone 12 mini to his $3,500 iMac, and he's able to <laughs> generate a 4K H HDR Dolby Vision video um, out of his iPhone like 10 times faster than his $3,500 iMac. So mm. Apple Silicon with its acceleration and its just optimization across the board for what it's doing, obviously is going to outperform anything that's got a lot of underlying software that it has to run through and translation and all that nonsense. Whereas Apple can you right. know, do a lot more at the chip level. So it's hard to say exactly. Yeah. So one of the other things too that's different now in these Apple Silicon Macs is the RAM is integrated. So if you had gotten a discrete graphics card, like if you have a MacBook Pro 16 inch, like I have an AMD Radeon graphics card in my 16 inch, you know, there's RAM dedicated to the GPU. And then you also have the system RAM. I have 32 gigs of RAM for the system. And so there would be, you know, dedicated a separation of the RAM here. Here it's universal RAM, meaning that when you get the RAM, whether it's eight or 16 gigs on any of these new Macs, that RAM will be used for both GPU and CPU. And the M1 will just intelligently decide which one is for which and where that RAM is going to go. And interestingly, you can only get a max of 16 gigabytes of RAM in any of these Macs. The MacBook Pro 13 inch, the new one, the Mac mini, any of them. And so again, I've had some people on Twitter were saying, well, you know, the RAM, just like in iPad and iPhone devices, even though it's only four or six gigs of RAM in those devices, because of the Apple architecture and the Apple Silicon, it's used to much better effect. And so in these Macs, just because it maxes out at 16 gigs of RAM, maybe that shouldn't, you know, bother us as we're buying these computers. I don't know. What are your thoughts on the RAM? Again, we're looking at a totally different system architecture here. Everything's going to be different and weird. People saw that 16 gigs of RAM and immediately started tweeting, I'm not buying this thing. There's no way I could get anything done on 16 gigs of RAM. It's This is back to that old, what MacBook Pro came out with a maximum of 16 and people were going crazy. But it was the MacBook Pros. Like when they, I think it was one of the redesigns, you could only get 16 gigs max. Yeah, it, we're back to that. But this time it's Apple's thing. I mean, just think about it right now. Like I'm looking at my iPad here. I think it has six gigs of RAM attached to an A12Z processor. Right. Now imagine if this thing had a 16 gigs of RAM, more than double it internally. Right. This device doesn't stutter. Obviously, I'm not running Final Cut, but we're talking about a completely different class of system here. Right. And a Apple obviously shows like it, it's the Android argument all over again. We look at Android and Windows and how they utilize their RAM and just how much goes to overhead of, you know, doing anything and you, you buy a Samsung phone with 32 gigs of RAM in it now. It's it's ridiculous, and I don't I don't know where it's going. <laughs> That's yeah. true, right? And those and those phones are not going to be like noticeably or practically faster than an iPhone 12, right? So it's not like more RAM in those phones are giving you some benefit. That isn't to say, though, in the future, you know, when we see that 16-inch MacBook Pro or whatever Apple decides to come out with, we'll see that new whatever next-gen processor, M2 or M1X or whatever, right. with 32 gigs of RAM, and it just outclass anything on the market. We'll see. Yeah, and I'm curious, when they have those higher-end Max, you know, the what configuration you could get with these Max was, I was up for debate, you know, I was talking to William about it last week. And so right now, you know, your two options are you have RAM, eight or 16, and SSD size, 256 up to two terabytes on all three of these Macs, the new MacBook Air, the new Mac mini, and the 13 inch MacBook Pro. And so that's the only configuration you get. And so the what I'm curious about is once they start moving Apple Silicon to those higher end machines, like the iMac, 16 inch MacBook Pro, maybe even Mac Pro one day, I'd be curious if there will actually be a choice of processor like you do now. You know, you can get an Intel i5, i7, or even i9, or if there'll be like a M1, M1X, M1Z kind of chip choice. 
which doesn't seem to jive with how Apple might work it. But I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Something one of our writers, uh, Mikey, or editors, I think, uh, Mikey Campbell, he works our night shift. He commented, Intel has always been about megahertz performance clocks and uh, gigahertz right. performance clocks and whatnot. So Feeds and speeds. Yeah. So uh, when you're looking at buying a Mac, you will pay attention to the RAM and stuff. But when you're looking at those Intel processes, you're looking at clock speed. How fast can it go when it's right. operating normally? What's, what's its overclock speed? What can it reach? And I don't think Apple wants to talk about any of that at all. I mean, we can clock these chips yeah. and see how fast they go. I, I didn't see the uh, gigahertz uh, benchmark on this one. It was supposedly 3.2. Yeah, 3.2. That, yeah, 3.2 gigahertz on the M1, which, you know, that's the first Apple Silicon chip to ever go above 3 gigahertz. That's impressive. But at the same time, does it really translate to what we're doing on these computers? Right. As apps get optimized for... Apple Silicon, I think we're going to see more emphasis on stuff like the neural processor and how many processes per second that can handle, because that thing, I think, is behind a lot of this accelerated workflow kind of stuff. Yeah. So surely this chip is going to be super powerful. And But let's talk about some of the limitations there seems to be on some of these new Macs. And so first off, it was the MacBook Air. Really here, we have no fan. That's kind of the biggest hardware difference between previous MacBook Air, obviously the Apple Silicon. But with this new MacBook Air, it's a fanless version, which is pretty attractive. You know, I think that is, you know, very cool. We still have the 720p FaceTime camera. No Face ID was introduced, nothing like that. But the ports are also a little confusing on all these devices. And so Apple was saying that they are Thunderbolt USB 4 ports, but that does not mean that they are Thunderbolt 4. Like these are Thunderbolt 3 USB 4 ports on all these new Macs. Does that sound right? Yeah, it's a weird spec because USB 4 is new. I don't think you can even buy a peripheral that runs USB 4 yet, but it's basically a container that includes the speeds of Thunderbolt without actually using Thunderbolt. It's just a future-proofed port for that spec. Right. But Thunderbolt 3, it runs exactly the same as any other port on any other existing Mac today. Right. Talking displays and these new Macs, from what I have seen, these Thunderbolt 3 ports can power like one display. So on the MacBook Air and the MacBook Pro, the new 13-inch models with the M1 chip, you can plug in one display. The Mac Mini with the M1, you can plug in a display in one of those Thunderbolt ports, and you can get a second display with the HDMI port. So you can get a maximum of two displays, but it's a little wild that you can only get one display on that Air and the new MacBook Pro, but also those two computers only have two ports. You can't get a 13-inch MacBook Pro with four ports with the M1 chip. Right. It's definitely a weird limitation. I'm not sure uh, where it lies. It could be in the M1 chip itself. It could be in how Apple's handling the controllers for the Thunderbolt ports where they have to license this stuff. There could be some sort of fees involved. The best guess is Apple's has to limit it for the M1 chip. I mean, right. you can you can still connect a Thunderbolt display. You can connect one of those ultra fines and still use that as a dock slash display and have everything run through the single port, which is fine. But what you can't do is daisy chain. You can't have uh, like the previous MacBook Pro, I believe you could connect a 4K monitor via Thunderbolt and then connect that monitor to another one and then have two external monitors. So right. no matter how low you go in resolution, even if it's multiple 1080p displays, you can't do it for whatever reason. Right. Yeah, so that's interesting. I know Andrew L. emailed me and a bunch of other people tweeted saying that was unfortunate. And in addition to the display limitation, there they seem to have removed the possibility of using an external GPU like the Blackmagic eGPU or others with the Thunderbolt ports. So it seems like you cannot use an eGPU, which I guess architecture-wise makes a little bit of sense. But, I mean, that's unfortunate that you can't yeah. plug one of those into a MacBook Pro anymore. That has everything to do with Apple's discrete GPU they've built in. I don't think it's going to work with anybody. Right. And um, I don't think Apple's going to come out with their own external GPUs. They're just going to tell people you're fine with what you have um, built in. <laughs> Buy the more expensive Mac right. in the future if you need it. Yeah, exactly. So those are just interesting caveats now that these new ports have. This episode is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Let me ask you something. If someone out there kept a log of every single thing you did every minute of the day, that would be pretty creepy, right? Well, what if I told you that's exactly what happens every time you go online? Whether it's your internet provider like AT&T, Comcast, or Spectrum, they're allowed to store logs of every website you've ever visited and can legally sell that data to anyone. That's why you get those weird ads for stuff that just come out of nowhere. 
That's why I always use ExpressVPN. I love ExpressVPN because it's the most trusted VPN out there. I use it on all my devices, my iPhone, my iPad, my Mac. You can even get it on smart TVs and it's super easy to use. ExpressVPN reroutes your internet connection through their secure servers so your internet provider can't see or log what you do online. Now you might be thinking, well, if all my data is running through a VPN, doesn't the VPN see everything I'm doing? And while many VPNs claim to have a no log policy, meaning they don't save what you do, many have been caught actually saving that customer activity. ExpressVPN is the only VPN I trust because they use their trusted server technology. They were the first major VPN provider to engineer all of their servers to run in RAM. This makes it impossible for their VPN to store any of your data, including logs of any ExpressVPN customer. And you don't have to take my word for it or even ExpressVPN's word for it. They're so confident in their no logs claim. They had one of the biggest assurance firms, PricewaterCoopers, audit their technology. It's no wonder that CNET and Wired named ExpressVPN the number one VPN in the world. I honestly recommend it to everyone, especially as we even get more creepy kind of privacy and security things going on. I always say just use ExpressVPN and you'll be protected as you browse the internet. So stop letting people keep logs of what you do online. Visit Express vpn.com slash apple insider right now and find out how you can get three months free that's e-x-p-r-e-s-s vpn.com slash apple insider expressvpn.com slash apple insider to learn more our thanks to expressvpn for sponsoring this episode let's talk about the mac mini just for a second this is actually one of the more interesting ones to me so you can get the new mac mini for a hundred dollars less than the previous models Mac Mini. It's at $699. You can upgrade it up to two terabytes of SSD and the 16 gigs of RAM. And I don't know if you saw this uh, GIF on Twitter. I think it was a basic Apple guy tweeted this and I'll put a link in show notes to the GIF. But they actually show the insides of the new Mac Mini running the M1 chip and the old Mac Mini running Intel. And the innards are much less like there's just a lot less there because the logic board is so much smaller it's just an iphone connected to a battery at this point (laughs) right and for the mac mini there's no battery so it's just like an iphone and there's a fan in there and that's it you know so really attractive actually and looks pretty cool and i imagine that leaves more room for batteries in some of those portables really curious what the battery life will be on whatever 16 inch or larger laptop they launched with the M1 because that just would seem like a ton of space for battery. Yeah, the Mac Mini is interesting here because for $699, you can get a desktop computer that can run two monitors that can process software at the same rates as a, what, $3,500 MacBook Pro. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, it's wild. My question is, so, you know, I was almost planning on getting something during the announcement because I was... I don't know, just really excited about these M1 chips. For me, I feel like I need to see real world use cases as far as speed, how it runs Final Cut and all that stuff. So I didn't jump the gun. I'm going to wait and see what people say about it. But obviously I was interested more in the portables. You know, you got the 13-inch MacBook Air, 13-inch MacBook Pro. And so I don't know the answer to this, but I'll see if you do. As far as capability, what is the main difference between the MacBook Pro and the Air Aside from the body form factor, the only difference seems to be that the Air does not have a fan and the MacBook Pro does, has some kind of cooling system. So I assume that means the MacBook Pro will be able to push the M1 a little more because it has a cooling system. And that seems like it because it's both 16 gigs max RAM, both two terabyte max SSD, both only have two ports, those Thunderbolt USB 4 ports. So does, am I wrong? Does that seem like the only difference? Plus a touch bar. Everyone always forgets the touch bar. Oh, the touch bar. I don't know if that's a uh, feature or not. Right. I think the, the, they just <laughs> left it on there because they're using the same case as the 13 inch. But right. I, th- I think if I remember this correctly, uh, it's because it has that fan, it can run longer at peak speed. Right. So you're going to get the same performance out of both in quick fat like operations. But if you're chugging out a two hour video from Final Cut, you're probably going to see longer and faster performance out of that 13 inch MacBook Pro. So that's where the pro name comes in. Anything that's going to be more intensive than regular editing or you know quick quick think projects you're going to need that macbook pro for longer sustained actions now we'll have to see this in testing yeah. but that's probably the only real benefit you're going to have out of having that fan better cooling right so then we come to 
Who should buy or which one should you buy if you're in the market for a new laptop? Now, keep in mind, for the Mac Mini and the MacBook Pro 13-inch, the Intel versions are still available for sale, new on Apple's website. So if you need a MacBook Pro that's 13 inches but has four Thunderbolt ports, you can actually get that still on Apple's website with the Intel chip and all that. And if you want a Mac Mini with an Intel chip, you can actually still get that as well. The MacBook Air is really the only computer in Apple's lineup where there is no Intel version that you can buy new directly on the site. And so for me, my recommendation, my recommendation is if you are any kind of prosumer or pro user and you are trying to get a powerhouse Mac for some use case, I would say hold up. You know, wait for 2021. Obviously, we're going to see more Macs coming out. Tim Cook said that this transition is going to be a two-year transition. So you're not going to be waiting forever. Uh, This is not like Mac Pro territory where you got to wait five years for a new model. You know, we're going to see surely the iMac, the 16-inch MacBook Pro, and maybe even some Pro-level computer like an iMac Pro with an Apple Silicon. So any kind of pro use case, I feel like I would wait and see what's going to be coming out. But if you were in the market for a MacBook Air or a low-end Mac laptop, uh, just, you know, maybe you already have a desktop Mac, maybe you have a powerful computer and you wanted just something t- for portability. I think this new MacBook Air is probably the most tempting of the bunch, if, especially if you were in the market for a portable. And if you have some kind of student that's going to be, you know, university or some use case for students. Maybe it's just, you know, school at home, but you needed to upgrade a home laptop. Again, I think this MacBook Air is probably of the most attractive one. You know, get at least 512, if not a terabyte SSD. Uh, but I think it's a great option. What do you think, Wes? Well, yeah, if you've waited this long uh, for Apple Silicon to be in the Mac, you've got a little bit longer to wait. I mean, <laughs> if if something's broken at home or if your kid's starting school next week, yeah, jump on that MacBook Air right now. Very few people, I think, would need to jump up to the Pro unless you just really like the touch bar. But that, that MacBook Air is the go-to device right now. Or the Mac Mini, of course, if, you, if you're sitting at a desk or you know doing a lot of at-home work or at-home school work, yeah. that desktop's going to be really good and long-lasting for a while. But I think what's more interesting from this event is what's around the corner. I mean, mm-hmm. come, come March and fall of next year, we're going to see new iPad Pros running t- uh, oh, yeah. A14 tier chipsets. We're going to be seeing the iMac with a new redesign. That's pretty much guaranteed at this point. I mean, if they don't redesign that iMac with Apple Silicon, they're never going to redesign it. So, because it, it's been what, <laughs> 2007 since the last time we saw an actual change to the iMac design? Right. Yeah, it's been a while. So, the, I'm, the iMac Pro is super long in the tooth, too. Yeah, the I, iMac Pro, that's that's the question here is the, the Pro models, the Mac Pro and the iMac Pro for the desktops. What is Apple going to do here? Because the Mac Pro was sold with modularity in mind. I mean, are we going to see Apple sell a Mac Pro with an iPhone chip? in it well practically for all intents and purposes a right. the m1 or m2x or whatever then a bunch of slots to stick some more mac minis in there to chain them together i mean <laughs> right. where, where's the modularity aspect coming in i don't see apple playing nice with these other companies but won't they have to if they're going to maintain modularity or are we going to see apple make a bunch of their own parts and sell them at a premium which won't make pros happy i don't see that being very fun for the market but that's yeah. that's a far away problem that's probably the last mac we're going to see in this turnover but still interesting to think about what is going to happen between now and then. Yeah, for sure. It's an exciting time, for sure. So curious what's going to happen. But there are a ton of links to all the stuff that came out this week, all the news about the new M1 chips and Apple Silicon. So check out all those links in the show notes and let us know what you think. Did you grab one of these new Macs with the M1? I'd love for you to tweet at us and let us know. Now, unfortunately, I would love to have you talk about your new iPhone Pro Max, not MAC, but the MAX, but uh, should be arriving as listeners hear this episode, right? Probably tomorrow. I've had a whole debacle with my order process. Um, it's all my fault too. It's not no one over at Verizon. I can get into that real quick. If anyone on here uses privacy cards, uh, heed the story. So <laughs> so first of all, I had messed up. I've moved since the last time I ordered an iPhone, but of course I didn't think about it. Place my order right away, put it in the system. Bam, it's on its way. Second after they went live on Verizon's website. But guess what? They're getting shipped to Virginia Beach. Well, <laughs> hmm. of course I live in Tennessee now, so I had to cancel that order and reorder it within about five minutes of orders going live. Congratulations, your iPhone's arriving on release day. 
Great, your payment has been denied. Why? Because the privacy card used on the Verizon account was used for Verizon Fios, not Verizon Wireless. So it saw it as a different vendor mm. and denied the charge. I spent a bunch of time on the phone with Verizon customer service and they said, whatever's happening here, we tried getting you to reapply a card. I couldn't, no matter how many times I did, it would just reset. So they canceled that order and put in a third one. So my resin account order page looks crazy right now, but I have a third order for an iPhone 12 Pro Max coming <laughs> December 4th now. I was just really angry and they're like, no, 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 don't worry. We're gonna put you up in the system. You obviously ordered it in time. So we're gonna retain mm. your place in line and put it back. Just ignore that ship date. So as of right now, it says okay. UPS has generated your shipment tag and it's for next day air. So I should either see it tomorrow or Saturday, which is exciting. Okay. Curious to hear about your experience with it. There were lots of reviews that came out, obviously about the Pro Max and the 12 Mini, The Verge of the Review, Joanna Stern of Wall Street Journal. And then Austin Mann, who is the photographer that I mentioned last time, you know, he does those annual iPhone camera reviews. And so he took the Pro Max out and definitely reviewed that. And you know, the whole big news was the new camera system there, you know, 40% larger sensor, the sensor stabilization as opposed to the optical lens stabilization. So very curious real world scenarios, Wes, with how you fare with it. There does seem to be improvement, especially in low light, especially in low light portrait shots and things like that. And so we'll see uh, when that comes out. And also the mini, lots of reviews out there. And man, that thing looks small in people's hands, I got to say. But you know, that's kind of an attractive size for a lot of people. Check out those reviews, see the mini. If you got a mini or a max, be sure to tweet at us too. We'd love to hear it. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about the camera system if we have a second. Yeah, please. This stuff's really interesting to me. I've been a nerd about photography for a few years now. Um, first thing that came out and the first thing I saw you tweet on Twitter was, thank God the camera's not that much better. I feel good about buying the iPhone 12 <laughs> Pro now. I think I think verbatim, I was like, I just wanted my FOMO, my fear of missing <laughs> out, to go down just a little bit, and MKBHD uh, helped me there. That's all. Right, right. No, I, and, and, that's, and it's fair. I watched his video, and everything he said was fair. It's Definitely worth noting that anyone who's in a well-lit room isn't going to notice a difference. Right. I mean, you could take every iPhone from the last five years, shoot the same photo in a bright, sunny day, and yeah. it's going to be hard to see much difference between the images. Maybe sharpness, yes. but that's about it. For sure. Move into darkness that's when things get a little crazy. And I mean, I saw uh, one example shot of, I think this was MKBHD as well. Was it the dog sitting in the room? The dog with the candle thing. Who was that? I think that was Austin Man. That was Austin Man. Oh, right, right, right. So yeah. that that was my, that, that was the thing I saw and said, that's what I want because yeah, for sure. that right there, I mean, think about when you're most using your camera. Obviously the bright sunshiny days out, outside capturing the dogs and the kids running in the yard. That's great. But a lot of us, especially lately, have been spending our times inside or dimly lit restaurants, or eventually we might actually get to go out to a bar again. Right. And those locations, that bigger sensor and stabilization coupled with the LiDAR and everything on top of it is going to make a huge difference for indoor lighting and for indoor photography. So that that's the stuff that definitely compels me. And again, I'm just definitely sold on the 12 Pro Max. I, I, I would be very disappointed in myself if I got the regular size Pro. For sure. And like, I, I mean, there's still a part of me that was like, oh, maybe I should have just gone with it. I just remember the last time I had a Plus phone, I had the 7 Plus right before the 10 came out. And I loved the Plus. I was all, all about the larger sizes. And then once the 10 came out, I did the 10S. I tried the 10s Max for a week and just something about that size. And again, this is just everybody's preference. You know, it, it hurts me to know that I don't have like all the features that are possible to have this year. And so it's not like I have zero FOMO. It's, it's just lessened. Uh, but it is definitely clear that in low light, the Pro Max is going to do better. And the Verge's review, I'll put a link to it. You know, Neelai Patel took it out. <laughs> he was taking portrait shots of like a stuffed monkey or whatever. And that is when you can definitely see if you zoom in on like the hair or fur and that kind of stuff, there's definitely a noticeable improvement on detail. And like, it, it's not fuzzy. Like it's just not as fuzzy. And so for that low light stuff, for sure. And if you do any kind of, you know, prosumer or just hobbyist camera type stuff, photography, absolutely. The Pro Max is better. Like it is not a question of, is it better or not? It is definitely better. Uh, and especially in those low light deals. Now you're going to have a regular 11 or 12 to compare it to once you get it. So all I have is my iPhone 11 Pro. My mom is very interested in the iPhone 12 mini. So that could be a thing we'll be getting at some point. 
but okay. she's also blind as a bat, so I don't know if a smaller screen is going to be good for her. <laughs> and because uh, if you increase the font size, then you get like a word per scroll. You know, if you get in those text messages. Yeah, her her Facebook feed is going to be three words on the page. And <laughs> move down. <laughs> One thing about the size I wanted to know is I I did order. I I think I mentioned last time I ordered that Backbone One controller. That snaps around right. your um, iPhone, like one of those game vice controllers, but much more updated. Yeah, this thing's cool, but I will note that their design took into account the curved edges of the iPhone 11. Oh. So the top side where the iPhone sticks out is completely flat, just sticks out up the top. But underneath where the iPhone sits towards where the joysticks are is a curved edge to meld into the side of the controller's design. Mm. And I am very concerned that my gigantic iPhone is going to hit that corner of that curved edge and not fit into this controller grip. It's going to be very, very close. Yeah, I might have to shave off some plastic. (laughs) Yeah, right. Exactly. Chip that away. Oh, that's interesting. This episode is brought to you by Clean My Mac X. Clean My Mac X is an all-in-one cleaning and optimizing software utility for your Mac. I love Clean My Mac X. I use it on my iMac and my MacBook Pro, and it does an incredible job of cleaning your Mac, keeping it decluttered, and helping it run super fast. Especially if you have an old Mac, maybe you saw those new Apple Silicon Macs come out and you're kind of jealous that they're going to be super fast. Listen, you can speed up the Mac you have right now by using the tools in Clean My Mac X. This cleaning utility is simple, super user-friendly, and it works wonders on your Mac. It can speed up and breathe new life even into those old Macs you have lying around. Clean My Mac X also has powerful functionality and useful features. It knows the apps that are installed on your Mac and their permissions, so it can tell you which programs are accessing your camera and microphone. The app's most popular feature, they call it the Smart Scan, and this is a great feature for scanning your entire system, including the log files and user cache and things that are no longer needed but are taking up space. Clean My Mac X will remove those safely. It also do a quick malware check and run optimization tasks to speed up your Mac, and it just takes a couple seconds. You can also use Clean My Mac X instead of the built-in activity monitor because it handles all those performance draining processes on your Mac and optimizes it even better than the built-in tools. Clean My Mac X gives you more control over your apps, your files, and you can find out what apps and programs you have on your Mac and uninstall the ones you don't need. One of my favorite features is that ability to delete an app off your Mac and know all those other files like in the application support and the library, it will delete all the files associated with that app and not leave any left behind. So if you want to make sure your Mac is running as fast as possible, delete apps safely, scan for any kind of malware and unused files, Clean My Mac X is the way to do it. Learn more about Clean My Mac X and you can actually download it for free at macpaw.com slash podcast. That's M-A-C-P-A-W dot com slash podcast. Our thanks to MacPaw for sponsoring this episode. I will say too, did you, are you getting a case with yours? Nope. I'm going to be caseless for this phone. I got a couple of those wallets. I got one of the Apple wallets and I got one of the knockoffs on Amazon because I was impatient and didn't want to wait till December for the Apple one. Right. So I'll be testing both of those out. I just wanted to see how the third party ones would, would fit. Peter McKinnon talked about the Apple wallet. Apparently he is a guy who kind of just like handcrafted his own wallets and sold them or whatever for a while and went over the details of just like the design and stuff and really, really liked it. But what I liked about the video was him talking about how he was able to use the wallet with the phone, how it magnetically stuck on well enough that it wasn't scary because everyone who's talked about it so far seemed afraid that just by having the wallet on the phone, they were going to lose their wallet, that it was just going to randomly slide off the side and never to be seen again. And uh, he, he shook the phone around, threw it in the air and it was fine. It was snug on there. It, Obviously, if you push on it with your finger or something, it can slide off because you're going to lose that magnetic connection. But him showing like him pulling it in and out of his pocket with a little bit of training, he he went on a little bit of crazy tangent of like, just use your finger and train yourself. It's like, I don't think you need to go to that extent, but I don't think it's as bad as people were making it out to be. So I'm I'm very interested to try out one of these wallet things. Yeah, that's curious. I did order one, but I think mine's like set for December. So (laughs) it'll be a little delayed. But yeah, I'm looking at his video now. It's pretty cool. So yeah, look at the link in show notes for Peter McKinnon's video. He does a lot of testing. He's doing some <laughs> slow motion videos of him putting the wallet in his back pocket and uh, staying on there. You know, actually, now that we talked about the wallet, I also will mention case wise, the leather cases made by Apple that usually launch every year 
with the iPhone. They didn't come out when the 12 and 12 Pro were released. But if you got up to order either a HomePod Mini or iPhone Pro Max, 12 Pro Max or 12 Mini last Friday, you could actually get an Apple leather case for all the different size phones. And so I actually ordered the Apple leather case for my 12 Pro. I got the Saddle Brown one. Ordered it that day, came in Monday. So it came in three days later. I think now the shipping times are slipping. But I will have to say, vastly prefer Apple's leather case with MagSafe to the silicon case with MagSafe. You know, the new 12 models, because it has those square edges, in general feels a little chunkier than the 11s. Again, more of an optical illusion than it actually being thicker. But the silicon one just made it feel even larger. And the leather case is much more streamlined. I love the feel. Uh, doesn't add very much bulk. And it's MagSafe built in, Apple's leather case. So if anybody was wondering... If you like leather cases, if you've liked Apple's leather cases in the past, you'll really like the ones for the 12, 12 Pro, and 12 Pro Max. And what is interesting, though, Apple actually shows this little ring around the Apple logo in some of their gallery photos for the leather case, I guess implying that if you MagSafe charge it all the time, it's going to develop a ring on the leather. And so, for you, listener... So you can know before you do it. I am solely charging with MagSafe now with the leather case. <laughs> and I'm going to see how long it takes to develop that ring and if it's pronounced or what happens to it. So I will uh, post updates regularly on Twitter. I posted a picture of the white silver iPhone in the brown case that I have now. It looks pretty good. I, li I like the look of it for sure. But uh, I'll let you know how that MagSafe ring patinas on the new leather case. If I had to get a case for my phone at all, it would be leather. And I really like how leather wears down over time, kind of telling its own story. And having that mag MagSafe ring there doesn't bother me a bit. I remember people kind of no. worried about it um, when Apple first announced, like, I think there was like a disclaimer somewhere on the website, like the MagSafe connector will wear in or something. But I think that's interesting to me, especially that it's just a ring around the Apple logo. It kind of gives its own little look and it's always going to be in the same spot. It's not like the ring's going to move around. So I think that's kind of cool. Yeah. Now, now let me tell you this. Let me give me, give me your thoughts on this because The Verge actually had a video famously, I think it was a couple of years ago. I'll put a link to show notes in this, but Dieter Bone like did a manual patina ing so if you want a patina look immediately you can kind of do it so it looks like it's an aged iphone case i feel like that's cheating i could be wrong yeah that's cheating <laughs> okay yeah i just it's like buying pre-washed jeans <laughs> yes that i don't know like i when it patinas it's your story like you just said it's the whatever wear that shows up after months of using a leather case it's your hand it's your like how you use the phone and so the leather case is like your story because it's patinating that and i know that that sounds a little weird i don't know but I, that's what i like it yeah go to nomad's website and any case that they sell they tell a love story about how beautiful your case is going to be after you've wore it in and yeah i don't know I, I i i'm definitely gonna fall for something like that i love that that's a cool thing you can tell a story with you know slowly destroying the leather on your case but i mean that's, <laughs> yeah. that's cool stuff like i i have a leather a couple of other watch bands that i have completely ruined over time but it, they look they look really cool you know got that yeah exactly leather cowboy look almost at that at that point now some people i think even john gruber has talked about this but like if you go caseless whatever nicks and scratches you develop on the iphone itself is also a way of telling a story i don't know how i feel about that no, i, <laughs> I, I prefer my iphone pristine and this one's going to be interesting because yeah, exactly. i mean the stainless steel ring is so pronounced around these iphone pros so i feel like any any nicks or scratches over time you're I, I don't know if you're going to feel it with your fingers or see it uh more visibly but i'm definitely a little bit more worried about this one now did you get a blue one pacific blue yeah i was going to go graphite but at the very last minute i said never mind i'm going to get pacific blue because i got the blue ipad and it's such a subtle color that i figured if the phone's similar as people say to that subtle tone i'm okay with that i think that'll work yeah well very cool well let us know listeners again what color did you get? What case? Do you like the leather? Do you pre-patina your case like an animal? No, just kidding. If you do that, we, we love you too. But let us know. I'd love to see a picture of that. And so also, as we record, macOS Big Sur is actually being released publicly. Unfortunately, the release was a little late, so we won't talk about it in this episode. But be sure to tune in next week. I have not run any Big Sur beta, so it'll be totally a new experience for me. And I'll give you my raw thoughts about it on next week's episode you've been running big sur on like a mac mini right yeah i've been running it this this whole beta cycle from the first dev beta and i'll go ahead and tell you that i have no opinion other than the icons are square i i <laughs> i turn on the mac mini 
a couple times a month to play a Nintendo 64 emulator. I I work from an iPad. It's not something I'm looking at very often. So I do like the new design. I know some people were kind of against it, but again, coming from mainly an iOS, iPad OS user, I like the familiar familiarity of it. And just like with, I think we forgot to mention like the Macs moving to more iPad things like the keyboard getting um, iPad like keys and such like that. Right. Do not disturb and stuff like that. Yeah. The OS itself also getting some of those visual cues is kind of nice. And it'll be interesting to see how other developers, third-party developers implement that into their design of the Mac, of their Mac apps as they go to universal apps rather than different binaries. So be very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So tune in next week. Next week's episode, we'll talk all about Big Sur. And real quick, you know, Apple actually launched a new repair program for the AirPods Pro. And this was actually something that I was experiencing. My left AirPod Pro was getting static at times, especially when I was on calls, uh, like Zoom calls or even phone calls. And so I actually did the Apple support, you know, get into a text conversation with them. They really grilled me. They asked me a bunch of questions like, when do you experience it? Is it both or just one AirPod, this and that? And so we finally got it to a place where they sent me a replacement left AirPod Pro, just the left one, because that's the I was just experiencing it in the left one. So they sent it to me. It comes in this cute little cardboard box with real, you know, interesting like packaging. And so I replaced it. I sent my old one back. They include the shipping label and everything. Very easy process. And my left AirPod Pro is working really well again. So if you have an AirPod Pro and you're hearing some static or crackling in some use cases, even if it's not all the time, don't hesitate to reach out to Apple support. You can do the text thing and they all send you out, you know, a replacement kit. I had actually brought them to an Apple store first and they tested it in the store with music and it didn't crackle then. And so I felt like a crazy person. But if it does keep happening and it annoys you, I mean, AirPods Pro are not like super cheap. So, you know, take advantage of it. Do the repair program. They mail it to you. Then you mail your old one away and good to go. So I got mine replaced. Sounds much better now. And I'll put a, a picture in the chapter art in the podcast for this one. You can see the little box it comes in. It's pretty funny. But anyway, I, I will say, though, that yeah. it would drive me insane personally, knowing yeah. that <laughs> the one AirPod is newer than the other. And then I'll be sitting there guessing, it's like, is the audio better out of my left ear now? Or listen, <laughs> yeah, I planted that in your brain. <laughs> I was hoping that they would just send me two. But I, I needed to be honest. Like they were saying, like, is it in both? And I was like, no, just the left. But I also had the idea of like battery life. And it's like, if this is a new left AirPod Pro, is there going to be like a large disparity in battery life like months from now, like where the left one lasts all day, but the right one dies halfway through? So I I did have those thoughts and it is bothering me. It it was also weird. Like I did have to repair the AirPods. Like, you know, I put it in the case, open the case, open and close it a bunch of times. And I eventually it was not reading the left one. And so I went to the Apple support page and it says you actually throw it on the charger for 20 minutes. And so I did that. And then I take it off. You hold the pairing button on the back until it starts fading in and out with a white light instead of the amber or orange color. And then I was able to repair it. I did have to remove it from my settings, like remove the AirPods Pro device completely and re-add it. But then both of them are paired. But that my thought did cross my mind, Wes. So thank you for, for reinforcing it. Oh, uh, that's what I'm here for. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, since, <laughs> since that was my uh, tale of woe and recovery, let's round out the show telling our listeners your tale about trying to get a PS5. And uh, yeah, what happened there, man? Well, I don't know what PlayStation's deal is this year. Xbox seems to be smooth sailing. I don't know. There might be horror stories from that end, but it seems like their pre-order time went perfectly. Everyone who wanted to pre-order one got in and out pretty quickly. And then release day um, on the 10th, I just see everyone, including Federico Vitici over in Italy, holding their new Xboxes. Everyone's just loving their new consoles. And I'm over here in PlayStation <laughs> land, just like the world's on fire. Nothing's working. Uh, nobody knows anything. We're just guessing as we go. Like the pre-order day was Sony said, OK, pre-orders are on this day at this hour through most of our retail partners. And then somehow, like a day before that, everyone opened pre-orders and all the bots went in and bought all the PlayStations before any human could even bother. Mm. So Sony's like, oh, sorry. Well, just keep checking with our retail partners. There'll be other pre-order periods between now and release date. And it's like, okay, cool. Well, our uh, buddy, Andrew O'Hara, he keeps sending me links like, go, go get it now. It's, <laughs> it's, it's available on this website right now. It, and 
I go click on it. And by the time I get there and click pre-order, it says we're sold out. <laughs> I'm just banging my head on the desk. So uh. finally comes release day and it's like, man, I'll just, I don't know. I'll, I'll go bring my iPad. It has LTE. I'll work in a target parking lot. If I have to, I'm going to get one <laughs> of these playstations and Sony announces two days before, by the way, we're not going to have any in-store um, availability at all. It's online only. Good luck with our usual retail partners. And I'm just like, you did this before. <laughs> this isn't how this works. So get online on uh, yesterday. And, you know, Andrew again, fishing me links, showing me that, oh, yeah, um, <laughs> here's GameStop. GameStop's going to have some PlayStation 5s available early today before the 12th. Mm. What does that even mean? No, no times, nothing. So I refreshed GameStop all day, no, nothing. Midnight comes around, GameStop, oh, Newegg, both saying, we have new inventory in stock, click here, and you click on it, and it takes you to a page where it says everything is already sold out. <laughs> Pure insanity. And now, as we record, we are seven minutes away from noon, and Walmart says, at noon today, you will be able to order a <laughs> PlayStation 5 on our website while supplies last. So they're probably already sold out. It's not even 12 o'clock yet, so we'll, we'll see. Man. Well, we will go so you can try again. <laughs> See if you can get it. You know, I've seen. Have you seen those memes where like people are using the AR? You know, where they could put a PS5 on their kitchen counter and they're like telling their significant other that they got oh one. Oh lord! Yeah, that's funny. Just dirty. Well, I, I wanted to <laughs> comment on this just briefly. It's interesting to me how this can be such chaos, and it just goes back to, again to like how Apple handles everything top to bottom, from them manufacturing to shipping to how we pre-order it. Right, like. You, you just yeah. order an iPhone the day that they're available and you're put on a list and get one when it's ready, right? right? Whereas PlayStation's like, you can order it as they come and if you don't order one, oh well, we don't want your money until <laughs> you, the next batch comes in. And it's it's so strange to me how all of it falls together. Yes. Well, I hope you can get one soon. And uh, yeah, we'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Uh, I'm not a super big gaming guy, but I don't know. I see some of these screen grabs or you know videos of gameplay from this ps5 and it looks ridiculous like really good so well listeners let us know what you're getting what have you gotten this season this whole tech season with the iphones and the homepod minis and we'll talk about the homepod mini again next week i know i have a couple coming in andrew's got a couple coming in next week so tune in for that and big sir and we're talking about the iphone pro max you can tweet at all of us. Our Twitter handles are in the show notes. We'd love to interact with you and hear from you there. If you haven't yet, we'd greatly appreciate a five-star rating and review in Apple Podcasts. You can do that. And don't forget to check out HomeKit Insider. That show comes out every Monday. Andrew and I talk about all the HomeKit devices and news that are coming out. And we review products. It's a lot of fun. Lots of listener questions and engagement there. So we'd love to hear from you there. And thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next time.